Well, as we uh, turn back to God's Word, let's just bow in a word of uh, prayer for a short moment. Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to your Word, O oh Lord, may you speak to your people, may you uh, educate us, may you feed us, may you meet us at the point of all of our need this evening. And perhaps uh, some of what we say will be uh, challenging. Lord, help us as your people, as Christians, to always be biblical, to never veer away from anything but what the Bible teaches us. So lead us and guide us and may we depend upon you always. In your name we ask it. Amen. Well, let's read again at uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Everybody, both young and old, is searching, at least at some point in their life, to answer the question of who am I? And when, within our nation, particularly uh, in this very moment, there is an identity crisis. The world will tell you that you define your own identity. But the Bible tells us. That your identity is rooted in your creator. And I believe that as a church, as Christians, we need to be wrestling with issues and matters that arise from, from, uh, from this confusion. And we cannot just bury our heads in the sand. But it is very important for us. To be equipped in how we would respond to such cultural issues that every one of you, in one way or another, are facing. If it is, in particular, the obvious examples that come out of this text as cultural issues would be, would be the issues of homosexuality and transgender. And our response... And our opinions on what the Bible says is going to affect our view on marriage, on our relationships, and in our ability to live a godly life. I want to uh, raise uh, three points uh, this evening. I want to look first of all at our reflection. That we are made in the image of God. I want to look at our distinction. That we are made male and female. And only as a consequence. And only as because it is such a matter uh, that is prevalent in our culture. I want to look lastly at our confusion. At the subject of gender dysphoria. I want to look at our reflection our distinction and our confusion. So do not be misinformed. This is not a sermon about transgender or gender dysphoria or homosexuality. I was actually, when I was preparing this sermon, uh, I read something of Alistair Beggs, which just helped me keep 
my focus. He said uh, nothing to do with this, but he said when the peripheral matters become the central matters, the central matters become the peripheral matters. And so we must keep focused on what the Bible says. And this is a sermon on Genesis 1, 26 and 27. But by consequence, I think we must answer the question in regards to the confusion. So our reflection, our distinction, our confusion. First of all, our reflection. As we uh, live our lives, we are to reflect our uh, creator because we are made in the image of God. What does that mean that we are made in the image of God? Well, there's various uh, things I could say, but the first thing you notice is the meticulous language that is used even in these uh, two versions. The contrast between the way that in the first chapter of Genesis, the way the inanimate objects are created and the way that man is created. Let me show you. In, verse, in chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 14, how does the creation on these various days begin? They begin, let there be, let there be, let there be. And you see, God speaking this impersonal something into being on those days. He says, let there be light, and there was light. But now listen to how man is created. In Genesis 1, 26, from let there be, let there be, let there be, to let us make man. You see, even the personality of God working to bring this personal being into existence is reflected in the language that he uses. There is like a, a divine pause. When it comes to the creation of man, it is like there is discussion in the Godhead as creation as we know it comes to its climax, comes to its pinnacle in the creation of man. And so you must know, all of you must know, that you are lovingly. You were lovingly and you were carefully and you were wonderfully made by our personal God. We are from the dust, but we mustn't lose sight of the fact that we have been formed by God. Across the page in chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. It is as though this God who, who has seemed to this point so in some ways detached from us personally. But now he has come down and intimately has interacted with humanity. He has breathed life into man. We don't see him doing this for the giraffes or the monkeys or the plants. But no, he sets humanity apart as he takes special time and attention and interest to fashion us in his image. The language that is used. But along with this language God uses, there are three elements to our being which set us apart as we reflect God's image. The first element I want to show you is that we have personality. We have a personality just like God has. And to have a personality you must have knowledge, you must have feelings, you must have a will. Knowledge, feelings, well, we can say that the animals have some personality, but they do not love. 
and they do not worship. The second thing, the second element is that we are moral. We have freedom. We have a responsibility. Adam and Eve showed obedience via the tree of knowledge, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But since the fall, the freedom has been further restricted. And we are not able now, we are not able to not sin. Understand? We are not able to not sin. Yet there is still a limited freedom for us, even in our fallen state. And with that comes a sense of moral responsibility. In other words, let me try and illustrate. We do not need to sin as often as we do. And even when we do sin, we still know that it is wrong and therefore confess our likeness to God. We are personal, we are moral, but lastly, in regards to these elements in the image of God, we are spiritual. Even though you possess a body with life, like plants have life and like animals have life, only humanity possesses a spirit. It is on the level of the spirit that you are aware of God and are able to commune with God. But before we move on, we must note that this image, this image of God in humanity has been affected. It has been affected by sin. We no longer reflect in the way that Adam did before he fell, but we are still image bearers. There are vestiges uh, of the image remaining in us. But the effects of the fall can be seen in our body, in our soul and in our spirit. Because you see at the moment of sin, our spirit died. At the moment of sin, our soul began to die. And our body will eventually die. And this is why we need the gospel. God will come and he is going to save the whole person. Beginning with the spirit in salvation. Continuing with the soul in sanctification. And finishing with the resurrection of your body. Our image will be made new. As we are made to be like Jesus Christ. We are made in the image of God. But secondly, there is distinction uh, between us. You see in verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We are created either male or female. We will look in more depth uh, at the end, but this is a debated point. Many people will tell you that there is no difference between uh, gender and that it is merely a choice. But sexuality in particular is the result of the creative act of God. Maleness and femaleness are therefore good and meaningful just like all aspects of God's creation are good. We are distinct and we are separate sexes. Men are not women and women are not men. Hold on to your seats as you hear the statement, but don't leave yet. A man is absolutely superior to a woman at being a man. 
And a woman is absolutely superior to a man at being a woman. And so it is sad that in our world there are those who are trying to reverse divine decisions. Who are trying to be God. Who are trying to make decisions about their own gender. Men and women are equal before God. But there are distinctions. And they are distinguishable. Man is to lead. To protect, to care for, to cherish, to initiate. The woman is to respond, to receive, to bear, to nurture, to follow. This list is not exhaustive. I listened uh, to a sermon by uh, Kevin DeYoung recently on biblical manhood. Uh, and within that sermon, he actually quoted somebody else who had this line. And it struck me. He said, husbands. And he is referring to Christian uh, marriages in particular. He said, husbands. You are the one in your marriages who is to say the word, let's. It's that small word, let's. You're the one who is to say, let's go home. Let's talk. Let's forgive. Let's go to church. Let's read our Bible. Let's pray. I just leave that out there. But within the marriage bond, there is a deliberate comparison to uh, the Trinity. We say in theology that the three persons are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. But within the Trinity, there are also uh, distinctions. Because the Son voluntarily subordinates himself to carry out the wishes of the Father. And the Spirit voluntarily subordinates himself to carry out the united wills of the Father and the Son. And you see, therefore it follows that the subordination of the woman to the man in marriage is a voluntary submission. She entered into the marriage by accepting his proposal and so she becomes, as 1 Peter 3 demands, uh, submissive and obedient to her husband. And John Piper, he, he speaks about the mystery of marriage. And it's incredible. Because right after the account of how woman was created, the writer of Genesis says... Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. And the Apostle Paul uh, takes this up in his letter to the Ephesians and he's, he quotes that verse and then he says, This is a great mystery and I say it refers to Christ and the church. You see, the marriage bond between a man and a woman is, is a symbol of the relation between Christ and his church. With what Paul says, this is our clue. He unfolds the meaning of marriage. It is a symbol of Christ's love for the church represented in the husband's loving headship towards his wife. And it is a symbol of the church's glad submission to Christ represented in the wife's relation to her husband. Marriage uh, between a man and a woman is a portrait of Christ's covenant with his people, his commitment to his church. Just cast your minds forward to that uh, glorious day when Jesus Christ shall return 
to this earth. The heavens are opened, the trumpet sounds, the Son of Man will appear with power and glory and with tens of thousands of holy angels shining like the sun. The age-long preparation of the bride of Christ, the church, is finally complete and he takes her in her arm and leads her to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He stands at the head of the table and a great silence falls over millions of saints. And he says, this, my beloved, was the meaning of marriage. This is what it all pointed toward. This is why I created you male and female and ordained the covenant of marriage. Henceforth, there will be no more marriage. And given in marriage. For the final reality has come. And the shadow can pass away. There will be no marriage in heaven. Between you and your spouse. That may sound sad. Especially for those of us who are preparing to get married. And yet it will be the opposite. There will not be a sense of loss with this earthly relationship. But rather there will be a fulfillment as you enter into that ultimate kingdom of God. And you are able to cry out fully, I have found the one whom my soul loves. The last thing uh, I want to say on this distinction between uh, man and woman is regarding children. Humanity was given the rule over the creation to care for it, to work in it and to reproduce uh, within it. As God's people we are instructed to become creative like him. Adam and Eve did and humanity has continued to do so. Bearing children in the image of God. We often say that he is just a chip off the old block. That she has your eyes. He has your nose. Humanity is producing image bearers. Reflecting what God originally did. And just... As a note, how catastrophic it is then when image bearers are brought to life within the womb. But each individual has the power to end that life because of their own will, because of their own decision. One MP I read is quoted as saying that in Britain in 2018, the most dangerous place to be is in the womb. We have uh, seen our two points uh, thus far. The uh, distinction between uh, male and female are reflection that we are made in the image of God and finally I want us uh, to look this evening at the confusion and so with this biblical understanding of being made in the image of God and created male and female we can try and approach in particular this uh, transgender issue I don't admit by any means to be an expert uh, on this subject. Um, I've spent the last week or so uh, immersed in uh, in different literature in regards to it and what I I found uh, various uh, sources to be incredibly helpful. But I do think that as a church we need to be interested, informed and biblical. In how we approach 
such issues. I will only scratch the surface uh, on this matter, but from there we can build our knowledge. I want to uh, mention, first of all, just three very brief points in regards to this. First is the sinner. We need to be clear that anyone who is going through difficulties and challenges regarding gender dysphoria are not to be described using derogatory terms. They are sinners. If anyone of such a persuasion would walk through our church door, we acknowledge that they are sinners who need grace. And are we not all sinners who need God's grace? Is it not Christ who says in regards to another form of uh, sexual immorality, he says when they find the woman who has been caught in adultery and they bring her before Jesus and he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. They are uh, sinners. We might be uh, tempted to respond to this kind of person with shock and dismissal. Reducing their psychological experiences of gender dysphoria to bizarre novelty or even derangement. But that is most certainly not the Christian response. Instead, we must approach these individuals with both grace and truth. However, by not dismissing The reality of their inner feelings is not the same as affirming those feelings. But in most cases, the experience, their experience, it cannot be reduced to simply living a lie. Since most don't feel like they are lying. In fact, The opposite is true. People with genuine cases of gender dysphoria believe it's their biological body that is lying. And a person in this situation truly believes that he or she is a member of the opposite sex in genuine cases. And hear this. That each one of them is an image bearer. Of God. Imbued with endless dignity and eternal worth. And we must note, I've even learned, I will not give any detail, but I, I have learned even this week that these issues are not isolated to us here in the seaboard villages. Our children, your children, are being taught to some degree on this in their schools. Certainly on social media and on the programs they and you perhaps watch. It is within our community and it is perhaps attached to or connected to some within our church. So we do not term, use derogatory terms, but they are sinners who need grace. But the second uh, point I want to say in regards to the confusion is that it is a sin. A sinner and it is a sin. And we need to be clear about that. We need to be biblical about that. It's, it isn't a sin because I say so or because our church says so. It is a sin because the Bible says so. God made men and women different on the deepest of levels. Andrew Walker, who I, I found most helpful uh, in different articles that he had written, he writes this. Our brains 
our chromosomes, our voices, our body shapes, our body strengths, our reproductive systems are different. The design for what our bodies are structured and destined for are different. And these designs bear witness to the differences that reflect God's creative will for humanity. And so it follows that just because someone decides that I'm going to be the opposite gender, it does not mean that you are. Because how can, if our chromosomes are different, our brains are different, our voices are different, our body shapes are different, our body strengths are different, our reproductive systems are different, just because I choose does not mean they've changed. Men and women are different. It is, f it is philosophically impossible for a man to become a physical woman or for a physical woman to become a man. Your psychology cannot change your ontology. But let me allow the Bible to speak more than me or anybody else. Uh, there are various verses that we could uh, go to. I, I have, for whatever reasons, chosen these two. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. If there is no repentance, there will be no entrance to the kingdom of God. To live a Christian life is to accept God's authority over you. Matthew 19 verse 4. At the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So that they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And so it follows that rejection of God's purposes cannot be reconciled with following Christ. Here in Matthew 19, Jesus reiterated the binary reality of immutable sex differences. Someone can either embrace a transgender identity or find their identity in Christ. But it cannot be both. They are uh, sinners. It is a sin. And thirdly and finally, the need of a saviour. Regardless of if you have any understanding or comprehension of transgender or gender dysphoria or homosexuality or anything in that regard. Do we not all need a saviour? Because regardless of having any of this knowledge, of this debate, not every single one of us as image bearers are also sinners. Who need the grace of Jesus Christ. You may not be guilty of transgender issues or homosexuality. But I am sure that most are guilty of lust. Not to mention a host of so many or any other kind of sin. One sin is one sin too many. My friends, we all live in broken bodies and we all need redemption. 
and in Jesus, and only in Jesus, all things will be made new. There is hope, of course, there is. There is hope for those who are struggling with gender dysphoria. It will be a long road to bring their perceived gender identity back into conformity with their biological sex. But with Christ, all things are possible. While none of us are uh, guaranteed full restoration in this life. When we give our lives to Christ, when we submit to his authority, we have full hope and faith of an eternity and fulfilment of uninterrupted love with our creator. And then that body, our resurrected body, it will have no confusion attached to it. No flaws. It will be our glorious body. I saw, uh, as we finished, I saw a church uh, notice board, or this was an extra poster put on their church door uh, locally, this church. And I saw that it said, welcome. And within that poster, it listed all sorts of individuals from various categories, high and low and well-to-do and confused homosexual, uh, transsexual, heterosexual, all are welcome. And we as this church must also be as welcoming too. But this particular church notice, it was very embracing. It was very welcoming. But I have no idea what they were being welcomed to. Because after reading that poster for about 300 or 400 words, I did not once read the name of Jesus Christ. If you are or know that person struggling with gender dysphoria or identity or struggling with mental health issues or whatever it is. Or even uh, going to the very basics that you are a sinner. We are all sinners. You will only find, you will only discover who you are. You will only find ultimate peace when you find Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let us uh, finish by singing together in Psalm 118 in the Scottish Psalter. We'll sing from verse 17 to verse 25. It's on page 398. Psalm 118 from verse 17. I shall not die, but live and shall the works of God discover. The Lord hath me chastised sore, but not to death given over. Let's stand and sing to God's praise. I shall not die, but
May the grace, mercy and peace of God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and abide in each one of us both now and forevermore. Amen.